Hi everyone, my name is Jen and welcome to The Book Refuge. Welcome to another raw day today. Um, it's been rainy and dreary out and so I just didn't feel like putting makeup on today. I know you guys don't mind, but you know, that's one of those things that you just like never get used to sometimes. You pull up the camera and you just gotta be like, you're awesome, stop worrying about it. And guess what? That leads into what this video is today, which I'm sure you can tell. That is my favorite females. In fact, my book girlfriends, if you'd like to call. Even though I think some of them, it would be super fun to be in a relationship with them. And some of them, I would be pretty frustrated because, you know, I'm kind of an alpha personality myself. So some of these ladies, I don't know how it would work. I recently just did an updated book boyfriends list and this year more than any other year I read some really fantastic female characters like just some of the coolest ladies ever and I have to brag about them too because you know what equality I think there's just as many awesome women I want to hang out with or you know maybe a little more than that as there is men okay so let's dive into this list a few of these books you're gonna see it. we're on both lists because you know when you have a male that awesome it takes a female of equal amazingness to handle them right so let's go ahead we'll dive into the historical ones I have for this because I have a few that has been one of the coolest things this year is I've always found really great heroes in historical romance you know my alpha boys my cinnamon rolls my dukes like I always got a place for them but I read some amazing women this year even in a historical setting where you'd feel like they don't have a lot of autonomy where you'd feel like things don't go their way that they make things happen there are some movers and some shakers in that area so let's go ahead and get started with a female that so many people will agree with me they just will that is beth who at the time we meet her she is the widow I can't remember what her last name is because who cares it's about to be Mackenzie and that's all that really matters but Beth is a widow and when we meet her in this book this is the madness of Lord Ian Mackenzie she is a about to get engaged to kind of a douche like a real douche canoe who wants to use her for her money because though she is a widow this woman that she was a companion to left her a lot of money. I'm gonna put this book down so it's not shiny. And so she doesn't have to get married again, but she is a little bit lonely and she wants a companion and she thinks this guy's pretty nice, so why not marry him? Then enter Ian McKenzie, who he is a beautiful, beautiful man. You know, I raved about him already in my book, Boyfriends. And he decides that he knows some information about this guy that she's going to marry and he goes to meet her and he decides like if he gets a good feeling about her that he's gonna tell her what's going on so he meets her and Ian and Beth have just an immediate connection and he decides that he's gonna let her in on what's going on and not only that he decides that he wants her for himself um, but Beth she though her being a compassionate and caring woman she again she doesn't have to marry to be happy and after the situation with this jerk she was going to date or she was going to marry she's like hey ian we don't have to get married how about we just be friends with benefits let's do that and ian is like oh no 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 you're my beth i don't want anyone else to have you i don't want you getting away from me and he doesn't mean it like that ian ian's possessive in that beautiful way of just like I want to protect you and care for you and love you not in the like I need to control your every move like that's really not Ian like he is completely motivated with Beth by care and love and it's beautiful but Beth she makes every effort to understand to understand Ian and like what his triggers are for what is called his muddles because as you have probably heard the reason Ian is considered mad is that he is probably most definitely on the autism spectrum and if he gets overwhelmed with information or situations he goes into like a spiral and will go kind of nonverbal, typical you know things you would see of neurodivergence and she makes an effort more than even his brothers who are very loving and protective of Ian he's their baby brother 
even more so than that, she tries to understand why he's like this and how to prevent those things from happening and try to be there for him when they do happen. And that's what makes Beth so high up there for me and why I am just such a fangirl of her and seeing her and Ian's relationship not only in this book but in future books just warms my heart so much and I love seeing them together. And in like the Mackenzie Christmas editions that come out, we get to see them and their children and I just, I love it. Next, I have to talk about Jessica from Lord of Scoundrels. Wow. Oh my gosh. Talk about a woman. Talk about a book that situation after situation that comes up, which we've seen before, we've seen, well, you haven't seen this book before, but trope after trope that could be a pitfall, that could be an opportunity for miscommunication. Jessica looks it in the eye and says, screw that. I'm not falling into this trap. I'm going to be open and honest. I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking. We're going to work on this. And when Sebastian, the Sebastian Ballister, the Mark, Marquess of Dane, when he acts like a douche canoe, Jessica is like, we're not doing this. Um, I can't even tell you all the bold and amazing things Jessica does because if you haven't read this book, you don't want to be spoiled for it. Like, I just promise you, Jessica will blow your mind. She's amazing. She's fantastic. Um, again, like, it. I can't even talk about the specific things, but kind of the setup for this is that Jessica Trent, she wants to own her own, like, clothing store, basically. Um, her family is in a little bit of a trouble. Her brother, who is the heir, he is in with a group of troublemakers, including Dane, and she goes to Paris to try and bring her brother back home. And she gets on the off on the wrong foot with Dane, who decides he's gonna do everything he can to ruin her brother and screw Jessica for coming in and being all, you know, appealing to him in funny ways and being so smart. And he just decides he's gonna get one over on her. But Jessica is so smart and patient and clever that she just keeps she just keeps heading him off in, in every way and what happens between them is just it's so good oh it's so good and jessica the way that she refuses to let misunderstandings like get in the way and the way that she continues to like hey why won't you communicate with me hey i'm talking to you hey this doesn't have to be a problem if you will just talk about it with me I'm not going to assume the worst of you. I love that because so many times in a romance, miscommunications is what pulls people apart. And that just happens. It does. I understand. M miscommunication, though it is my least favorite trope, it's also the most realistic thing because it happens in real relationships. We assume what people think of us. We assume what they're thinking about a situation. We don't always take time to ask. So when that happens in books, like, even though it annoys us, it annoys us because it's true. And we want our romances that are fiction we want them to be better than us you know we want them to make better decisions like when we're yelling at the book and we want them to make better decisions it's because we want them to be better than we are and that's just not how it goes but Jessica Jessica is better than we are she's amazing I I love her I love her please check out this book if you haven't it's one of the books that lives up to the hype and I feel like Jessica will be on your favorite heroines list after you read this as well. Then I need to talk about quick about these. I have Garrett Gibson from Hello Stranger. This is book four in the Ravenel series. This is about a female doctor who she's actually based on a real doctor at the time who competed her medical license and then the medical board of that time like changed the rules so that she specifically couldn't practice. But Reese Winterborn, who is fantastic, <laughs> he makes her one of his private doctors because he knows that if he has doctors on staff for all of his workers that they will be healthier and better protected. So he gives her a job there. Um, Garrett meets Ethan, uh, what's his last name? Ethan Ransom, who is a bastard Ravenel. And he's doing kind of some undercover detective work. He used to work for 
the police but now he's kind of like private and he's investigating some things and so his life is really dangerous so when him and Garrett have this like instant attraction to each other and they have some sexy feelings for each other he's like I can't be involved with you because I will put you in danger like it is a hundred percent fact that if anyone finds out that I'm interested in you they will be coming after you and I can't risk that of course they still risk it but I love Garrett she's so smart she's tough she's determined to have him even though he's being stubborn and thinks that she's dangerous, she actually knows self-defense. Um, she has, you know, quite a few different forms of defense that she uses because she does end up in a lot of dangerous places when she's going to see patients or parts of London that she ends up in. And so I really love that about her. She's a fierce, fun heroine. Um, I really think you'd enjoy reading about all of the Robinelles or the Wallflowers or the Hathaways, really any Lisa Claypez book you jump into, I think you're going to have a great time. I've yet to be disappointed by one. Even when a book starts out and I think it won't be as great as the others, it usually still is because Lisa Claypez is the queen for a reason. And then the last like historical one I have to talk about is The High Women by Kerrigan Byrne. And I'm talking specifically about Farrah McKenzie. So Farrah, oh my gosh. Mm. I love Farah so much. She, when we meet her, is, well, first we see her in a flashback where her and the love of her life, which his name is Dugan, Dugan, he murders a priest who molested her. And in doing so, he gets thrown into prison. And so she continues to visit weekly and bring food for him to the prison. The guards of course, don't give the food to Dugan. And eventually, Dugan is killed um, before his term is up. And so, Farah takes on his name. She takes the Mackenzie last name and lives as a widow for her life until the point we're meeting her. And when we meet her, she's working for Scotland Yard as a, like, um... Uh, what's it called like a scribe and she helps with different administrative work and there is someone named Dorian Blackwell who is the black heart of Ben Moore and he it turns out was in prison at the same time as Dugan and they are kind of like blood brothers and so Dorian wants to take care of Farah for his friend Dugan and so he basically kidnaps her and forced her to marry him and there's some secrets that go along with it. So the reasons why I love Farrah so much is that number one, she just doesn't take any shit from Dorian um, because she's lived a pretty tough life up to this point. She's had a lot of disappointment, a lot of trauma in her life, and she refuses to let this, you know, scoundrel and, you know, underworld king tell her what to do. Hell no. Um, and I, I love her. I adore her. I listened to this whole series on Audible Escape. It was wonderful. Farah and Dorian have an amazing romance in this series. Um, this series is very dark. Every character is touched by trauma in some way, so know that going in. But Farah made it onto my book girlfriend list because she just has such a strength of will. And once she finds out what's going on with Dorian and like his crew of people, she's relentless and you are going to tell me what's going on. And I love that about her. I love her so much. Okay, now we'll switch into some others. So those are the historical book girlfriends that I got. Um, quick, I want to mention Sienna from Kiss of Snow. Um, this is by Neilani Singh. This is book 10 in the Psy Changeling series, so there is a bit of work to get to it. However, I skipped ahead to this book because I read one through six and I couldn't take it anymore. I had to read about Hawk and Sienna. Hawk made it onto my book Boyfriends list because I I love the Alpha of the Snow Dancer clan so much. Sienna is a Psy, which means she has mental abilities that are, and hers are extremely unstable because she has a secret unknown Psy power that is very dangerous to her and people around her. And it is starting to crack. It is starting to overload her. At the same time, her and Hawk have had a flirtation for a couple years. She was previously underage when she came to the, the Snow Dancer pack. So 
Hawk was very careful to keep himself away from her because he knew he had feelings for her. The changelings, they have mates. Like they, they maybe find their mate, maybe don't. Um, they can be with someone who isn't their mate. Um, but it's harder to have children and you always run the risk that you will find your mate. If you've already, you know, if you've chosen someone to be your partner, you may then find your mate someday and what would that like do to you and hawk is pretty certain that he lost his mate as a child like he found his mate and before they both reached like puberty and made it together she died and so he believes he doesn't have another mate out there and sienna who has been fighting their attraction not as hard as he has because she wants something to happen is finally like make a move or i'm moving on because I can't deal this pain of waiting for you to notice me or make a move, even though I know you want me. And I love that about Sienna because she calls Hawk's bluff and she calls it in a couple of big ways. And I respect that about her so much because Hawk, he is the alpha. He is, you know, about 11 years older than she is. He has a lot on his plate there on the edge of going to war with the Psy. And so he doesn't feel like he has the right to go after this girl who, number one, he doesn't think is his mate, even though he wants her. Because again, you can still want someone who isn't your mate. And is it right to ask a young woman like her to take on everything that he is? But the thing is, Hawk doesn't know all the things Sienna has already lived through. The things that the Psy were doing to her when she was only five years old. So she is a fully like mature adult in a lot of ways already from the things that she's went through. And so watching her kind of shake Hawk from his preconceived notions and just kind of say like, you are being really ignorant and arrogant and, you know, not looking at the full picture. And so I love that about Sienna and their book. I know it's gonna be one I wanna reread again and again. I actually have a, another paranormal to talk about. Um, and the book is Lothair. The book girlfriend is Ellie. So Ellie was slow to grow on me, because mostly I think because of Robert Peckoff. Like I love him, I do. I listened to this entire series on audiobook. I bought them all, which I normally like wouldn't do. I bought, you know, all 18 books in this on Audible, paid for them, <laughs> holy crap. But Ellie grows on me because Ellie is one of our youngest heroines. She's in the, you know, lower age group. And she is the mate to Lothair, the oldest vampire in existence. He has a lot of baggage. He is evil. Like, he is. He's an evil person. There isn't really any good in him when we first meet him. And we've been watching Lothair the whole series. This is book 11. And... Elizabeth, when we meet her, Ellie, <laughs> Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, all the names he calls her, she is possessed by a goddess of what she possessed by. I can't remember, but like the goddess of death or the goddess of something like she's bad. And so Lothair, believing that a human would not, like a human mate is an insult to him as the most powerful vampire ever to live. His mate must really be the evil entity living inside Elizabeth. And so he, for the last few years, let Elizabeth be in prison to keep her from harming herself and destroying his mate inside of her. And he's been trying to find a way to kill Elizabeth inside her own body so to extinguish her soul so that his mate his mate can own her body so yeah Luther is an asshole we know this it's a thing but the things about Elizabeth that I love and why she is a book girlfriend to me is that number one when we first meet her she wakes up after the entity inside her has just murdered a bunch of people who were trying to like, they were trying to give her an exorcism, right? They're, because she is possessed, they were trying to help her. And that entity comes out and kills all of them and then retreats inside so Elizabeth can wake up to see herself covered in blood and know that her two hands did this. So she gets put in prison and she 
actively seeks the death penalty because she knows that if her body's murdered, then her hands can't be killing people anymore. So this woman chooses the death penalty and is seconds away from it being enacted because that's the only control she can take over her life is to end her life. But Lothair is not going to let her have that easy way out. In fact, he is freaking pissed that she would dare try to hurt the body that belongs to him. Yeah, this is tough. It's tough, guys. It's tough. What's so wonderful about Cressley Cole is that by the time you've worked up to the story, this is still a much more intense story than we've read so far, but it still manages to, like, redeem Lothair, which is crazy. But again, we're focused on Elizabeth. So then Elizabeth is now trapped in his penthouse and he keeps her prisoner and is like, you're going to be here and I'm going to do whatever I want with you or I'm going to kill your family. I'm going to make things miserable for you if you do anything but submit to me. So not great, Bob. Not great. But Elizabeth, she decides she's going to do whatever she can to make her body herself indispensable to Lothair. She's going to make him want her. If that's the only thing she can do, she's going to make it happen. And I've, I've read a few, you know, I've read other books in the sense of like a captor captive situation where all someone has is their body to use. But watching, watching Elizabeth, like they're having these really frank conversations where he's like, you're going to try you innocent, like, you know, you innocent mortal girl think there's anything about you that can tempt me good luck you know and Lothair throws down that challenge and Elizabeth she's gonna meet it and I love that about her and when I was looking through when I was looking through the IAD to pick my my favorite woman in it there's a lot of very powerful women there are Valkyrie witches demons a uh sorceresses who all have many powers and are alpha females who take no shit. But to me, there's something about the human women in this series, which there aren't very many who start out as human. She has like the biggest hurdles to overcome because she has nothing to fight with. The Valkyrie have powers and strength. The sorceresses have magic. The, the, you know, like everybody has something. All Elizabeth has is her body and her mind. And that's all she has to fight with. And that is why she's a book girlfriend for me because she takes what she has. She evaluates the situation and she makes the choices she has to make. And not only does she end up Loving Lothair, which you could call Stockholm Syndrome if you want. I would definitely say it's not because she's aware of her hatred for him until, you know, at the end of the day, like they are fated mates though. And there are things you'll forgive your mate that you wouldn't forgive someone else doing to you. Like that's just how paranormal fated mates works is the bad guy gets his happy ending sometimes because of fate. But those are fun stories to read. So Elizabeth takes on Lothair and... She's the queen by the end of that, and I love it. All right, let's talk about another queen who, same di same situation, okay? Same, well, not exactly, but kind of. And that I want to talk to you is about Yvine. I think that's how we pronounce her name. It's been a little bit now since I've read it, so hold on. Yes, let's talk about Yvine from A Heart of Blood and Ashes. Wow, does Evine get put through some stuff as well? Oh my goodness. So Evine has been kept prisoner by her father. Um, she has been tortured by him, watched her mother die by him, and she needs Matic real bad. Matic is to be the next leader of the Parsathan crown, but his parents are killed by Evine's parents. And so when he goes to get revenge, Evine manipulates things so that she ends up in front of him and suggests a marriage of convenience to him. He wants revenge against her and her father and brothers so badly 
He has hate in his heart for her, though she's done nothing to deserve it. He blames her for the death of his parents because his parents went to see Evine based on her desperate plea that they come to help her. And her father ended up, you know, capturing them and killing them and torturing his mother for months and months. And so Maddox, you know, he doesn't have warm and fuzzy feelings towards her. And she offers her body to bear his heirs, to be his wife, because they will have very powerful heirs together. She has certain powers, but her body is weak. Her father purposely kept her body weak. She has a few phobias because of being locked in a tower for her whole life. She is very naive in a lot of ways, but she's very powerful and determined. And this is a woman who, when she meets him and makes this trade, where she's like, I will give you anything. And he's like, I could just take what I want. And she's like, you can't take it. I'm giving it to you. And there's power, there's power in that. And Maddox's not a bad person. We, we, we love him. He is very stubborn for a long time and it's hard, but he's barbarian. Okay. He's barbarian. Like they just got some rougher edges, but watching Nynaeve just be completely vulnerable and humble and willing to be like embarrassed and humiliated over and over again to win his trust. He eventually of course realizes what an ass he's being and his men and women who protect him, which that's actually called a dragon, the people that protect their, their king or their lord. So that's one of the reasons this is called a gathering of dragons is like these, this group around him is called the dragon. Put this book down. Um, they say like, you're treating this woman horribly and she's done nothing but try and help you again and again. Um, there are scenes where it could almost feel like assault will happen, but Evine just, again, is just like, you can't take what's given to you. Like, I don't know how else to tell you. Like, you can do whatever you want to me. I will do whatever I have to do to prove to you. And the reason being is like, the stakes in this series are so high. Like, the destroyer is coming. He's gonna take over everything. If these different, you know, kingdoms and groups of people don't work together, he will win and like the world, like it will be over. But Maddox can't see past his personal hate at the moment. He's just so filled with anger that he can't see that. And so it takes Evine over and over again, laying herself bare to him for him to realize that there's more going on than what he's able to see right in front of his face. And so this series is amazing. The first two books and a prequel novella are all out right now. The third book, it was supposed to come out in December. It's been pushed back a few months, which made me sad, but oh, this series is so good. Um, but Evine, I just, I keep coming back to her because there's such strength in, she has nothing physically to offer. Like, her body's not that attractive because she's been kept kind of like underfed and weak so she can't use her powers. She's not considered beautiful, but the more that Maddox are around her, the more that she like grows herself like and how determined she is, she becomes so much more than just an outer beauty. And I love that kind of heroine. I love it so much. A couple more to go. So I have another fantasy to talk about. Um, and the female is Fortuna Sworn from Fortuna Sworn. So Fortuna is the last of her kind. She is what's called a nightmare. She can see what a person's nightmares are and project them to them so they feel like they are in a waking nightmare. When we meet her, her brother has been missing for a long time. And when a fairy shows up and offers to make her his wife so that she's able to get into fairy to find her brother she agrees however it's a bit of a trick because he's actually the king of one of the fake courts and he needed a wife to get more power and so now fortuna is married to a king of the seely it's either the seely or the unseely court i can't remember there's both in here and her brother is with is with a fae. Um, he's being manipulated and like forced into that. His mind has been kind of broken. But when Fortuna gets there to rescue her brother, he doesn't want to leave with her. And 
Fortuna ends up having to enter a competition to become the queen of the court because you are not just the queen because you're married to the king. It's actually you didn't even have to be married to the king. You could compete to become the queen and if you win then you are the queen even if the king was like married to somebody else. But if Fortuna becomes the queen each of the different factions of the Fae have to give her a present. And so Caliph, the her husband, like tells her you can ask for your brother's freedom if you want to. So Fortuna takes on these challenges to become the queen of the court. Oh my gosh, this is only the first book. There's also Restless Slumber and then Deadly Dreams and then another one. There's supposed to be like six books in this series. KJ Sutton, this is her, one of her self-published series. I love it so much. The third book is supposed to come out this December and I am so excited. I got reached out to her to read this as an arc like back in February and I gobbled this one up and the sequel within like two days because they were so good because it's a romantic fantasy and it's a dark. This has all the creatures, there's werewolves, demons, um, all the fae. It has Sarah J Mass vibes as well as like the Cruel Prince as well as like even darker fae than that. So this is definitely like new adult, adult, um, super sexy and Fortuna, she will steal your heart. Like she will steal it and I love her. So the last heroine I want to talk about, um, this video ended up being just as long as anything else, so that's fun, um, is Serafina from Twisted Pride. So this is book three in the Kimura Chronicles, and Serafina Holy cannoli, guys. She goes through some stuff. So she gets kidnapped by the Falcones on her wedding day. And so Ramo wasn't on my hero book boyfriend list because I would not want him as a boyfriend. All right. Nino was on my list because Nino is like much more like logic and calm based. Ramo is chaotic evil I mean I don't want to call him that because I don't feel like he's evil <laughs> but he's like not chaotic neutral and he's not chaotic good so like I would call him chaotic evil <laughs> because he just revels in messing up the other family's plans in mob world and so he kidnaps Serafina to prevent her marriage and then he decides he's going to win her um but it's pretty twisted. So this is a captor captive romance. He's determined that she will ask him to take her virginity. He won't take it. He will make her ask him for it. Um, and of course he goes about doing that in some interesting ways. Serafina is against her better judgment, like intrigued by him. And one of the like cool, cause like one of the like cool things about this is that, um, <sighs> Ramo says to her at one point, like, you're going to realize that you were never more free than when you were here with me. Because though it felt like she was free when she was with her family, you know, she was going to have this arranged marriage. There's nothing innately wrong with this man that she's going to marry, but Ramo points out, he's like, I'm asking you to ask me to take your virginity. If you were to marry this man, you wouldn't have a choice in that. You're his property. You would have spread your legs for him. You would have blooded the sheets for him. You would have been his doting wife and baby carrier your whole life. You wouldn't have had any choices. Whereas though I am physically keeping you locked up, all the choices are yours because I'm giving you the choice. And Man, there's a big, big twist in this book that I like won't just spoil in case you end up reading this series. But I also read, I've said this, like I read through the Bound by Bound in Blood, like the the series that comes before the Kamora Chronicles, where we get to see Serafina like as she's younger too, and like as things happen. And 
I love the Kimura so much more because they are more free in that way. They're still just as dangerous, just as bloody, but they are more like people always have a choice. Even the, you know, prostitutes that they're with or the choices that that the the Kimura make, they still always give you the choice to do that, which I know it's weird to explain it. You don't understand if you read the Mafia books. But it's true, like the Bound in Blood series is much more difficult for me to read because they're just bound so much tighter, like they're called Bound, like all of those books are called Bound. And then you get to the Kamora Chronicles and everything's twisted because they, they just don't do it the same way that the other families do. And Serafina discovers that and through this story, which I mean this takes place over about a, a year or so, the way that Serafina comes to see things differently is amazing to me. Like, it's amazing. And Serafina is so strong, and it's Ramo Falcone who helps her see how strong she is, and that she's a woman who won't put up with any shit, and she's also a woman who will love him better than anyone else could have loved him. And so, that's what makes her a book girlfriend to me. So. There you go. There's some of my book girlfriends from this year. I hope you will give their books a try. I hope you find them to be strong and awesome women like I did. Let me know some of your favorite women and I will check them out. Thank you so much for watching. I put up new videos three to four times a week and you can see some more of them right now. Bye.